When the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the water, holding back the scene. Should I ever need reminding how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. 
dead love for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. another in the fire, right? There was another in the fire with the three Hebrew boys. God was with the Israelites when he walked them through the water, man. Whatever you're going through this morning, whatever it is that you're going through, God's got you. He's got you. But man, you need to release it to him this morning. You need to let go of it. You need to bring it to him. You need to get it off of your chest, your mind, your heart. You need to take it to him. Because there's another in the fire with you this morning. He wants to deliver you from whatever is holding you back today. I want to encourage you, man. Lift your hands to heaven. Right? Praise and worship is an expression. It's an expression. When you raise your hands to God, you're raising them in surrender. And you're acknowledging his greatness. So as we go back into this song, I want to encourage you. Meditate on the words. Bring them to your Father. And let God release you. Release you from your weariness, your burdens, your bondage this morning. We serve a great and awesome God. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. Come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. Yeah. 
I've served stories, Lord, have proved your faithfulness. And I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend. There is beauty in what I can't understand. Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. And I believe. You're the wonder-working God. You're the wonder-working God. All the miracles I've seen, too good to not believe. You're the wonder-working God. And you heal because you love. All the miracles I've seen, too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. I can't resurrect a man with my own hands. But just the mention of your name can raise the dead. So all the glory to the only one who can. Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. And I believe you're the one. Too good to not believe You're the wonder-working God And you heal because you love All the miracles we'll see You're too good to not believe You're the wonder-working God You're the wonder-working God All the miracles I've seen Too good to not believe you're the wonder-working God, and you heal because you love. All the miracles we'll see, too good to not believe, too good to not believe, too good to not believe. After everything I've seen, you're too good to not believe, too good to not believe. Too good to not believe After everything I see You're too good to not I've seen cancer disappear. I've seen metal plates dissolve. Don't you tell me he can't do it. 
Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen troubled souls living. I've seen addicts finally free. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen cancer disappear. I've seen metal plates dissolve. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. And I've seen trouble so delivered. I've seen addicts finally free. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see cities in revival and salvation flood the streets. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see glory fill the nation like the world has never seen. Don't you tell me. You're the wonder-working God, the wonder-working God. All the miracles I've seen, you're too good to not believe. You're the wonder-working God, and you heal because you love. All the miracles we'll see, you're too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe after everything I've seen. You're too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe after everything I've seen. Too good to not believe. Thank you, Lord. All the miracles in our lives, Lord. Thank you for who you are. You are just too good to not believe. We've seen so many things, but we are so grateful for who you are, Lord. Thank you, Father. We praise your name. Surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me in, desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. And I surrender. Speak. 
thank you that you work in us and through us and we just thank you so much for being here in this presence being it just just being here with us filling this house with you filling our hearts and our minds with you reminding us of how much you love us and how much you do for us just continue to minister to us as we dive into your word lord be with pastor and fill him with your spirit and we thank you that you love us so much. You go before us today and you walk out of this place different because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
family. Yeah, yeah, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Jersey Sunday here. Some of you wore your jerseys. A lot of you didn't. That's okay. Um, I got my Rice jersey on. That way I don't get anybody mad. I got a, it's a Raider jersey. When Rice was playing with the, with the Raiders, it says Rice on the back, so that satisfies all the 49er fans. So we'll leave it at that, right? <laughs> so uh, joke or no joke this morning? All right, so you guys put a lot of pressure on me with these jokes because it's, it's getting harder and harder to find a joke, right? So, okay, so, all right, I'm going to throw this one out to you guys, and we'll see, we'll see how you like it. Um, so there's this farmer, and uh, he's out in his field one day, and there's this pig with him. And so his neighbor walks along, and he sees this pig, and it's only got three legs. So he says to the farmer, he says, hey, man, how come your pig's only got three legs? He says, well, one day I was out plowing my field, and my tractor fell on top of me and pinned me, and the, the pig came over and drugged me out and rescued me. He goes, oh, so he lost his leg, you know, saving you from the tractor accident. Well, no. He says, and then there was another time when my wife and I were sleeping, and the house catches on fire. And so he comes in, he wakes us up, and he lets us know the house is on fire, and we run out, and we were saved. He says, oh, so the pig lost his leg in the fire. He says, no. His friend's like, well, man, what, is, what are these stories for? What do you mean? Just tell me how the pig lost his leg. He says, well, when a pig is this good and loyal, you only eat them one piece at a time. <laughs> I know, man. I was struggling this morning. I, I just couldn't. I just, it was just too much for me this morning, man. I just, I don't know. I pulled that one out of the very bottom of the barrel. I mean, that's how bad that one was. So, <laughs> What's that? Pigskin related. There you go. See, now you saved me, right? They're pigskin related. I got to be on my game today. My boy Wordsmith's here today, so I got to make sure that I'm like on top of my game because he'll be critiquing me and stuff, so you know. <laughs> no, it's good to have him and Tiff in the house today. Um, uh, he's the neighborhood hope dealer, and uh, uh, that's who we uh, work with. Uh, for the toy drives, and, and uh, he does a lot in the, just in this area, man, um, you know, in the, in the streets, in the prisons, in the juvenile halls, and so it's just a real blessing for them to be here today. Normally on Sundays, they, they're in other places doing other things and getting, getting the gospel message out, so I'm just excited to have them here. And welcome to anybody else who's new here today. We just want to welcome you in the name of Jesus. So we're going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of Titus. And today, as we go into this section of Titus, a lot of you are going to be asking, like, why are we in this section of Scripture? I don't plan on being an elder. I don't think I'm being called to be an elder. So why are we looking at this passage of Scripture? Well, the reason we're looking at it is because it's part of the book of Titus. And so when we started this book, we'd been doing series for the last six months and had topical things, but the Lord had laid it on my heart to go back to our roots and to go verse by verse through the, through the book of Titus. Last week we looked at Paul and his call to be an apostle, and we saw that, that Paul and Titus actually visit, visited Crete, and while they were there, they were uh, instructing the churches that existed on things that needed to be done. And then we saw that, that Paul left, and he leaves Titus in charge. Today we're going to look at church leadership. Leadership is so important. Leadership is important in any area of life. Now, many aspire to be leaders, but they aspire for the wrong reasons. They aspire to be leaders because it brings notoriety or power, right, or authority. But this cannot be the mindset of the leader inside of the church. It will destroy a person. And it will take them outside the call of God. I know this. I personally experienced this. I wasn't ready for leadership, but I was put in leadership positions, and it destroyed me. God knows the pitfalls of leadership, church. And so he's put in place a criterion for leadership inside the church, and it doesn't look like leadership of the world. Now think about leaders today. Think about how they carry themselves, what they say. 
You know, if you watch a movie, the leaders in the movie are typical no-nonsense, talk crazy to people, they'll beat anybody up that looks at them sideways, uh, come on, follow me, we're going to go destroy whatever it is. Okay, that's worldly leadership. But God's leadership looks different. Here's the thing. God cares about the quality and character of his leaders. That's what it's always about, the quality and character of his leaders. And check this out. He rarely makes the logical choice. Let's go back to the annals of history, and let's look at the Bible itself, and let's look at some people that God called. Let's look at Moses. Moses was fearful. He was afraid. Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh, grew up with the best of everything. He had the best education. He he grew up in wealth and prominence. But he murders somebody, and he realizes that it could cost him his life, so he flees to the desert. While in the desert, he encounters God on the mountain. And when God says, I have called you, go back to my people, he starts groveling and he starts whining. Oh, I can't. They're not going to listen. And I'm not a man of eloquent speech. And Moses was afraid. Yet God took Moses, raised him up, put the power of the living God inside of him, and he delivered the nation of Israel out of the hands of Egypt. Think about David. David was considered useless in the family. He was the youngest of eight brothers. In fact, when Samuel shows up to anoint the next king, they don't even invite David. They just bring the seven brothers, and they leave David out in the field. And when God passes by all seven of them and says, no, this is not any of them, Samuel says, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, in essence, yeah, we got one, but he ain't worth much. He's out in the field kicking it with the sheep. He's doing his lowly duties. He says, bring him here. And when he shows up, they anoint him with oil. He's the king. Elisha was plowing the field when Elijah calls him. He wasn't doing anything extraordinary. He was out plowing his his family's field, and Elisha says, come. The disciples were considered uneducated and of low status. Remember when Paul and John raised the lame man up to his feet, and they were arrested, and they were before the Pharisees, The Pharisees said, we deem these to be uneducated men. God does not do the logical thing, church. He never does. I wouldn't be standing here if he did the logical thing. That's the truth. Listen, write this down. Write this one down. God does not seek out the powerful and wise, but seeks out men and women after his own heart. That's what, he, that's what he desires. That's what he wants. That's what he's looking for. Now, that wording there, after his own heart, that was the same wording that God used when he anointed David. Here's what you need to understand. David wasn't a man after God's own heart in the sense he was like God or had God's heart. He was after, chasing. That word after means he was chasing after God's heart. He wants you to be chasing after his heart. You and I can never ever truly have the heart of God because we live in a sinful body of flesh. So today we look at the character of leadership. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. As we go into your word, God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, that we would see what applies to us, God, that we would take it, Lord, and let it saturate the very being of who we are, Lord, and transform us, God. Thank you for your love and your grace. We praise you today, God. We come to you with everything in us, Lord, and we bring it to your altar and ask, God, that you would meet us here in Jesus' name. And all the church prayed. Titus chapter 1, verse 5, open your Bibles. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV this morning. It reads, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders, elders in every town as I directed you. So Paul tells Titus, look, this is the reason I left you where you're at. (coughs) Excuse me. Can I get some water? He says, I left you here to take care of the unfinished business. Thank you, bro. Take care of the unfinished business and to appoint elders. In other words, 
Paul calls Titus to put things in order. Here's what you need to understand. From the very beginning of time, God has been putting things in order. From the very beginning, when God spoke the very existence of the heavens and the earth, after each creation day, God says, it's good. <clears throat> now, what you need to understand about that word good, that word good in Genesis is actually kind of a bad translation. It's kind of, a, there was a little bit of an error in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The word is actually in Hebrew is tav. And that tav means put in, that it means put in order. So when God says it's good after each one of the creation days, he's not making a moral judgment. He's not saying, well, it, it's, it, this, was a good, this was a good day and this is going to be a bad. It's nothing to do with that. But rather, God is saying, I've put it in order. When we hear God tell Adam to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it can be misleading. In reading the phrase good and evil, one might think in terms of morality. In other words, of right and wrong. However, the term translated good, tav, which is used in Genesis chapter 1 to 2, chapter 3, has nothing to do with moral goodness or ethical righteousness. That's not what it means. Instead, the word good or tav here refers to functionality, quality, and organization. Therefore, rather than describing Moral good and evil in the sense of the tree of good, and, of, of, of good and evil and the tree of knowledge, right? A closer translation would be the tree of knowledge of order and disorder. Think about it. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created Adam and Eve. It was perfect. Everything was in order. But when Adam and Eve took of the fruit... When they tasted it and it was, it was good, they brought disorder to what God had created. God is a God of order. He's always been a God of order. And this is what Paul is thinking of when he's telling Titus, put things in order. Make it good. Make it tough. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Did you catch that? As in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Listen, when things are out of order, church, there's no peace. Think about it. When things are out of order, there's no peace. There's none. It's gone. Think about chaotic situations that you get into. We used to work a job where it got very chaotic. That's because there was no order. And we had to restore order, right? Listen, when things are out of order, there's no peace, church. And if you're struggling this morning with not having peace in your heart, maybe, just maybe, it's because there's disorder in your life. See, sometimes we've got to sit and take an inventory. See, we want to blame everything else and everyone else for the disorder in our lives. When sometimes, and a lot of times, I found out it's really me. There's a glitch in me. There's a glitch in my spirit. There's something in me that's wrong. Because listen, we should not be moved by our circumstances. We should be moved by the power and the glory of God. Amen? That's how we should be moved. I should not be moved with my eyes. I should be moved with my heart that's set on faith, focused on faith, going beyond faith because God is good and God is great. He then tells Titus to appoint elders in every town. Now, you need to remember that at that time, the church was meeting in homes, right? And let me tell you what real fellowship is. It's not getting together for the football game today or, or hanging out. That's Okay, let me tell you what real fellowship is. It was built around three things. Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the breaking of bread. And the breaking of bread wasn't like I'm going to do this afternoon when I'm going to be breaking out some burgers and everything else for the game, okay? And fellowship. That's fellowship, okay? Now, I'm sorry if that doesn't line up with what your idea of fellowship is. That's in the Word of God. That's not Dee's opinion. That's, that's the Word. That's what it is. And so they would meet in these homes, and this is what it was built around. It was built around God. 
and the word and praying and taking communion. And Paul says, look, you need to establish leaders in each one of these places that are meeting throughout Crete. So what is an elder church? Well, I'm going to blow you away on this one, okay? The word elder has existed in the Bible almost from the very beginning of its writing, okay? Now, if you remember, elders used to be placed at the gate of the city. Do you remember that, reading about that? And what they would do is when people would have a dispute or, or a, a matter needed to be uh, decided over, they would, people of the city would go to these elders at the gates. They would bring whatever the complaint was or whatever the dispute or the matter, and the elders would judge it. Well, the Hebrew word for elder is zakam. And let me tell you what that word means. It means bearded or older one. <laughs> Nothing spiritual about it, right? It's a physical characteristic, a beard and older. That's what it means, right? A person with a beard was considered to be older and wiser. Took a while to grow a beard, right? Took a while, not a goatee beard, uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, it takes a while. Listen, that word zakam, when it, when it was translated into the Greek, it was presbyterios, where we get that word presbyterian. And then in our English word elder, it still means the same. It means old. It means exactly what it says, elder. You know, respect your elders. That means respect them old folks. That's what it means, okay? And so from the earliest days, the Christian church... They followed the Jewish tradition of appointing spiritual authority, right, in the church to older, more mature people of wisdom. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 6, he says, A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. So you may be wise, you may have a beard, you may be older, but if you're a new believer, sorry, you can't come in right now. Why? Because the temptation is too great. It's too great. Trust me, I know. I know. I, was, I had things thrust on me as a young Christian that I was not ready for. I wasn't ready. And pretty soon I was mad at the church. I was mad at everybody in the church. I was mad. The church was this. The church was that. I blew out for five years. I blew out of the church, man. I, I'm never going back to church. In that five years, I realized it was me. It was my issues, my problems, my thinking. I wanted the church to be what I wanted it to be. Didn't run, it didn't go to my standard, so I blew out of it. Well, what I found out is when I come here, I'm coming here to offer myself. Man, I can sing hymns. I can sing a cappella. I can sing gospel. I don't care. I'm here to offer myself to Jesus when I come in and worship. And when I sit and I listen. I'm here to hear the word of God. I want to hear God speak from his throne and show me something in my life that I can take and apply and make me more in the image of his son. That's what it's about. And it's real easy to get all stuck on yourself about yourself. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So Paul, throughout the book of Acts, if you remember, he appointed elders in every town and every city that he went to in all the churches. And 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, which we're going through today, they talk about the leadership that's being established and specifically with elders. And so that's what we're going to look at now. Verse 6. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So the first thing that Paul says here is an elder must be blameless. He says the same thing in, T in Timothy chapter 3. So what does it mean to be blameless? Well, there's, there's many definitions of it. Let me tell you what it's not. Most people teach that being blameless is I'm being perfect and I don't make mistakes and I'm sinless and that's ridiculous. That's not what it means. The word appears over 99 times in the Bible. And it can take on some, some varying themes, but basically what it says is this. If an accusation is brought against you, it will not stand. Okay? That's what blameless means. People are going to accuse us of stuff all the time. 
We worked in a job where we were constantly in, well, some people were in, really in a lot of investigations. But here's the thing. They never stood. The investigations never stood. If an accusation comes, it can't stick, man. That's being blameless. Because we're going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. You might wake up every day and fall into the same old pattern. You might fall into the same old sin. But as long as you're trying to fight your way out, as long as you're going to the foot of the cross and saying, God, help me, give me strength, push me through this, man, you are blameless because why? You're hidden in Christ. It ain't about you, man. A lot of times we put people in leadership positions that shouldn't be there. And I've made that mistake through the years in, in various situations. And if I would just look at, at their life, just look at one aspect of their life, the blameless part. Not saying that they can't make mistakes, not saying that they can't mess up. But man, if the accusations, that person's always angry. Well, if that stands up in court, then you're angry, right? But if somebody tells me, well, that person's always angry or that person's always, always this or always that, and you're going, well, like, that doesn't stand up, well, then it doesn't work. Accusations will come, church. They're going to come. And after saying elders must be blameless, he's going to talk about the family now. Oh, the family, that's the key says, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Now, I believe that, that the two are one and that both are called. So my elders and deacons, they are husband and wives. Because the two are one. They're one flesh. Now, some people don't agree with that, and that's okay. We're not going to divide over that, but that's how our leadership operates. Here's what I want you to understand is that the marriage must be devoted to. That's the bottom line. Faithful in marriage is a key thing in order to lead. You have to be faithful. You have to be faithful to your wife or your husband. It is the most important relationship you have on earth. It's more important than your relationship with your kids. Some of you put your kids on pedestals. You idolize them. And that's dangerous thinking, man. Your spouse is your most important relationship. That's biblical. It's, it's number one. Paul goes on and says that children must not be out of control. I think one of the reasons, another reason that I sat down, not knowing it, re looking back, my kids were, they were out of control. They were running and gunning. They were hanging out in the streets. They were doing stuff they shouldn't have done. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And so God, in his wisdom, and in the situation I was in my heart, he, uh, he removed me because that wasn't right. Listen, I've learned something. The family is an indication, right, of how the home is managed. The kids tell me all the time. When kids are running around out of control and screaming and yelling and talking back at their parents and all that kind of stuff, I know that you're not running your house like you should. You're not running it like you should. The family is the indication. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It says, He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church that's god's word that's not that's not pastor d talking that's what god's word says if you can't manage your home how can you manage the church you can't manage four or five people in your home how are you going to manage a congregation full of people 20 30 200 2000 how can you possibly do it if you can't take the most important ministry you have and run it like it's supposed to be run and let me tell you something i'm gonna get on the husbands right now man you're not gonna like me but husbands, some of you, man, you are not running your family like you need to, man. You're not running your house. Your wife's running your house. Your wife is in control. And that's unbiblical, man. You are the covering. God told Adam 
that he was going to be the covering for his wife and that Eve's heart was going to be for her husband. Now, that doesn't mean that women don't have, trust me, y'all know mama bear, so I mean, my point is this, man, is that some of you husbands, you don't know anything that's going on in your house. Your wife takes care of the money. You couldn't tell me if there was $10 in your bank account or how much is in your savings account. You don't know what bills get paid. You have no idea. Unbiblical. You should know everything that's going on in your home. Everything. There are no secrets that are hidden from you. You are the man of your house. And you are to take care of things. Because I'm going to tell you, gentlemen, you will be accountable before God for what happened in your home. Not your, not your wife, not your children. You. That's the word of God. You couldn't tell me what your kids are doing in school. You have no idea. You basically go to work and you check out. Unbiblical, unacceptable, guys. It's unacceptable. You guys know my wife, she is my other half. She's not beneath me. She's not below me. She's equal with me, but I am her covering. And my wife, she's better with money than I am. I have no problem with her taking care of money, but I know where it's going. And I know what's getting paid. Why? Because I'm accountable. What if she slips up? What if something happens? I'm accountable. Bill collector still calls the house whether it's her or me. Right? Here's the bottom line. If a man cannot manage his family, then a man cannot manage a church. And you will not be part of leadership because you can't handle your home. He goes on in verse 7. He says, since an overseer manages God's household, oops, there you go, he must be blameless. And now he's going to talk about what blameless can look like in this situation. He says, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So after Paul talks about being blameless, he's then going to give us a list of things. Now, I want you to understand these are characteristics of a person. These are not qualifications or requirements. How Some versions of the Bible will say qualifications. But this is a character of a person. This is the character of a man or a woman. First off, he says overbearing. He starts out with that word. And I, I was well, God, why do you say overbearing? Well, when I looked up the word in the Greek, the word is authetis. And here's what it means, arrogant or self-pleasing. The leader cannot be arrogant or self-pleasing. I was arrogant and I was self-pleasing when I was in the ministry before I was taken out. It's all about me. It's all about me. As much as I was saying, oh, it's all about God, it's about God, it's about the glory of God, it's about the glory of God, it was me. I was self-pleasing. It was good. It made me feel good. It made me feel important. It made me feel powerful. Man, sometimes we need to check our hearts and ask, are we really doing it for the glory of God? He says quick-tempered. This is the person who gets mad easily over little things. Littlest thing sets them off, man. Hey, I don't care what it is. You're going to blow up and scream and pitch a fit. Quick-tempered. We are not to be quick-tempered. What does Paul say? Slow to anger. We should be slow it should take a lot to get us to the point where we're feeling that anger. But, man, I know some folks, man, I mean the littlest thing. They snap. Not given to drunkenness. What does this mean? Not going out and constantly drinking and getting intoxicated. That word drunkenness means a continual act, right? Some of you might overindulge today in the Super Bowl. Okay, shame on you, but... That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about somebody who's constantly in a state of drunkenness or addiction. No, we can't be that way. Paul says to be sober-minded, not violent. In other words, not displaying your anger through your actions, punching walls, kicking the dog, you know, throwing things because you're upset. Man, that's unacceptable. We can't do that. Not pursuing dishonest gain. What does that mean? Trying to make money illegally or ripping people off. Let me tell you something. We rip off, we rip off things a lot more than what we want to admit. 
right? A couple weeks back, I was listening to a conversation, and uh, a friend of mine was telling somebody else, hey, man, you don't worry about it. I can get that from my job. I'm thinking, do you own that? Who, who are, how do you get that from your, how do you take that from your job? Do you understand that that stuff that you have at your employer is not yours? Well, they don't pay me enough. Then get a different job. You agree to the terms. You agree to whatever salary you're making. You don't have the right to go and take from them because you think you deserve more. Go get a different job. Right? That's wrong, man. That is not right. You rip people off when you take a 15, 15 extra minutes on your lunch. When you're only supposed to take 30, you take 45. You're ripping off your employer, man. That's dishonest gain. But we don't want to think in those terms. We think dishonest gain is going robbing somebody or, you know, going to a bank and holding up a bank. No, dishonest gain is doing anything dishonestly and gaining from it. That's it. Word of God, not me. Must be hospitable. In other words, they must be welcoming, right? I look to see what the leadership does when people come in. Do they greet people? Do they make them feel welcome? If somebody's visiting, do you make them feel welcome? Not bombard them, because that's weird when you come in as a new person and like 7,000 people are on you, right? And when you're in a small church, you can feel that way because you're like, ah! But people are just excited that you're here, right? That's why. But still, how are you conducting yourself with new people? Are you inviting people to your home? Do you invite people in the church to your home? That's called hospitality, church. One who loves what is good. Ooh, God beat me up on this one, right? Right? One who loves what is good. Let me ask you something. Do you cheer the bad guys in movies? Man, I, 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 hey, trust me. When I would watch Sopranos or something like that, I'm like, man, yeah, I'm all in, right? But, man, we're cheering for evil. We're cheering for it. We're like, yeah. It's like, how can we cheer for evil? But we do because it's our flesh. We need to love what is good, you guys. Self-controlled, what does that mean? Curbing is one desire and things of the flesh, right? One of the things I'm trying to do is eat smaller portions. Not eat so much, man. I'm a professional leader like my boy. We're professional leaders, right? But we're going to be professional on a smaller scale, right? Not as much. Upright, listen to this one. That's rendering each his due. What do you mean, pastor? In other words, passing sound judgment on matters. Let me tell you something. When it says, when Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged, don't twist what he was saying. We judge everything. You judged where you were going to sit today. You judge what people wear and all that. What he was saying is be careful how you perceive and look at things. How you perceive and look at things, it will come back to you. We're to judge matters, right? We judge matters all the time. That's why you have a court of law, to judge a matter. Elders are to judge matters. They're to judge things. They're to weigh things out and say, hey, this is good or not good or this is bad or whatever. In Exodus, if you remember in Exodus, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes to Moses and says, listen, you are going to kill yourself because you're trying to judge every matter with two million people, it's impossible for you to do. He says, man, find 70 elders, men of good reputation, and have them come and assist, and have them deal with the lower level matters, and you deal with the big ones. Wisdom. Same thing in the church, right? Not that I'm untouchable or unapproachable, but there's things that the leadership need to be taken care of and not me. It should be coming to me when it's like gone past that. And I'll be honest with you, you guys wear me out. I'm one person, and I get tired, and, and I need help, and I need people to step up and help me because it's hard. We're not that big, but there's only one of me, and there might be 20 of you today. And so the elders are to step in, fill the gap, take the pressure off. Then he says holy. Now this word holy means a worshiper of God who's been set apart. So it's not just being set apart. You need to be a worshiper of God. You need to be a worshiper, right? You need to have a heart of worship, a heart of praise, a heart of expression for the Lord. 
And then the last thing he says is discipline. And this is the only time this word discipline is used in this matter, in this manner in the Greek in the New Testament. And here's what it means. Mastering, controlling, curbing, restraining. Mastering. Mastering your mind, mastering your will, submitting it to the Lord. Controlling, controlling your emotions, right? You cannot let your emotions control you. You can't. Then you become an emotional wreck. Curbing, like I said, cutting back and restraining, restraining yourselves, holding your tongue. Sometimes I say nothing because the Lord says, don't say, don't, why are you going to step into that mess? Don't say nothing, right? So those are the characteristics of an elder. It also says he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So elders need to hold to the sound doctrine of truth. And that means the only way you can do that is you must study the Word of God. A lot of folks don't study the Bible. They read it, but they don't study it. You need to understand the mysteries of God. There's things hidden in the Word that God wants to draw out for you, but He, he can't because you won't go deeper. You want to stay on the surface with everything. Well, I've got a relationship with Jesus. That's all I need. Well, is it? I mean, I'm, I'm just asking you, is it all you need? Then why do we have the Word of God? If the Word of God is, is just, I just need Jesus, I don't need nothing else. It's not true, church. His Word exists for a reason. And if elders do not have sound doctrine, if they don't understand the Word, then how can you encourage somebody? My accountability group is, is I've got Jack and I have Wordsmith, Right? And, and we are constantly communicating, and we hold each other accountable, and we encourage each other through the Word of God. When I'm feeling down, it's the Word of God that is brought to me to remind me to be encouraged by the promises of God. And when I'm out of pocket, it's the Word of God that corrects me. An elder must have the ability to confront. You cannot, conf you cannot be a leader if you cannot confront, and you must confront in love. It must be in love. So elders need to hold on to the sound doctrine so they can encourage and correct those in opposition. In Timothy, Paul states that elders should have the ability to teach. And this is why you need to have sound doctrine. You have to be able to expound on what you know. Now, there's many avenues to teaching, and I'm almost finished up here. I can tell you guys looking at your watches. Um, this, this is one part of teaching, and this is where everybody wants to be. But really, the best teaching in the world is when you're sitting one-on-one -on -one with somebody or you're in a small group of people. That's why I love small groups. That's why I pushed them so hard because to me, that's when it's the purest and it's, it's the most intimate, and that's when, you, that's when you can rightly divide the word of God. Iron sharpens iron, right? Teaching is, is one of the things that is required of an elder. And then there's one thing that Paul does not mention here, but it's a thing that is essential in order for an elder to be complete. And that's that they must have the ability to lead. Many can teach the word, but they're poor leaders, man. Poor leaders. They don't understand what it is to develop a team of people. They don't understand what it is to encourage them, to coach them up, to be able to sit with them and, and talk to them through hard things. Man, leading is not what most people in the church think it is. Being able to teach is a criteria for being an elder, but this one component, I believe, was purposely left out. Why? Because Paul didn't want the focus to be on leading. He wanted the focus to be on serving. The leader of God is a servant first. You die to yourself. 
You die to your flesh. You die to your wants. You die to your needs. I tell the leadership all the time, leadership is not convenient. It's inconvenient. It's not convenient at 2 o'clock in the morning when I get a phone call. It's not convenient at 1230 at night when I get a text message. And a lot of you in this room know that that's the truth, that you've done that. I've res- and I'll respond to your text message or your call. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. But church, we're called to be servant leaders. Elders lead by serving those in the body of Christ. And that's the bottom line. So in wrapping things up, if you think about it, if you really think about it, take the word elder out. If you really think about it, these characteristics are really what we should all aspire to have. There's nothing in those characteristics that I feel are are too far out of reach for any of us. I believe that they actually make up the character of the Christian, and it's the call of God on a person's life that separates them out to be an elder. Being an elder or leader in the church is much more visible is much more than having power or visibility. That it is. And unfortunately, a lot of people operate with the power and visibility aspect is. What it is, it's operating in humility through the Holy Spirit and serving the people of God. I used to tell my new leaders when I was working in the secular world and even in the church. I used to tell them, man, hey, you don't have to tell people your position and title. You don't have to tell people that. They know who you are, right? Everybody knows when you get a promotion. Everybody knows who you are. You don't have to come in and pipe, man, I'm in charge, I'm the man or I'm the woman. You don't have to do that kind of stuff, man. People already know. And it's the same thing inside the church. You don't have to do that. I I don't introduce myself as Pastor D. I introduce myself as D. You'll find out when I'm a pastor. You'll find out. It'll come soon enough. I don't have to tell you, yes, I'm the pastor. Thank you for, you know, showing up today. I appreciate you. Shoot me if I do that. (laughs) Listen, the person who continues to bring up their position or remind others of their position is not really called. You're not called. You're not called. Why? Because you're more concerned with how people see you and how you look in front of people than the responsibility that comes with it. There's immense responsibility when it comes to leading. And when I hear leaders are doing this, I pray for changed hearts or for God to remove them because it's not biblical church. It should never be our focus. And so in wrapping up, the second Sunday of February every year, we're supposed to give kind of a report on the church. We give a a fiscal report and kind of tell you things that are going on. But because my wife has been back east with her mom, um, we weren't able to get the financial reports ready. Hey, hey, uh, Rick, can you get Tom King for me? But one of the things I do want to do when talking about leadership is just real briefly, it's going to take about another minute. I just want to introduce you to who the leadership is of this church and, and what they do in the church and so that you have an understanding. And so um, uh, let's, let's talk about the board. What does the board do? Well, the board is, is required by the state of California and the federal government for any nonprofit organization. You have to have a board, okay? It's not biblical, but we operate under biblical principles, okay? So that's what our board does. So um, if, if Tom, can you come up here? Is, where, is Charmaine back with the kids? Okay. Um, Tom and Charmaine are on the board. Tom is, Tom is the chief financial officer of the board. He's, he's, a, um, he's got a title, I guess. And so uh, him, and, him and Mama Bear, my wife, is the treasurer of the board. They, they take care of the fiscal matters of the board. Rick and Lynette, would you come up? Rick and Lynette Williamson are also on the board. Rick is the vice president. Lynette is the secretary. Um, Rick and Lynette also serve as elders, so they have a dual role in the church. Okay, they serve as elders in the church. Now, I've known Tom and Charmaine and Rick and Lynette. We've known each other for 31 years. They were the first people I met as a Christian. Walked into a church one day, and there they are. And God keeps bringing us back and forth into each other's lives, so on and so forth. So Tom and, Tom and Charmaine... Uh, on the board, Rick and Lynette on the board, and they're also elders. Uh, Chris and Sarah, Chris and Sarah are also elders on the in the church. 
Um, Rick takes care of the, the men's Bible study on Thursdays. Chris is in charge on Saturday mornings for the breakfasts. Sarah is, is the IT person and media stuff. And uh, both her and Lynette and um, Charmaine help out Pat with the ladies' ministry. And then there's, uh, where's the Morantz at? Don't, don't think you ain't coming up. So this is Philip Morant. His wife, Donna, is probably in the back with the kids also. Philip is a deacon. And uh, um, let, me just, let me just cut through the chase. Elders and deacons, the only thing that separates them is teaching, but they both have the same duties. They really do, right? As elders, you can change a light bulb. Just as, just as easily as a deacon can, right? And deacons, we know that, that, uh, we know that Philip was a deacon and that Philip was responsible for evangelizing Samaria so they can teach the word of God, right? So let's just keep it real. Just some people are called for different things specifically, but we all do things together. This is the leadership. This is our leadership. This is who you need to come to if you need help. If you need something, come to them. That's what they're here for. They, they love God's people, and they want to serve God's people, and they're here for you. And so take advantage of it, right? Come to them with questions. Pick their brains, whatever you need to do, but this is what they're here for. I'm going to ask that they would remain up here after church service today and pray with people if they need prayer. And so next week, we're going to look at the, the actual uh, responsibility in carrying out of the duties of an elder. Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're going to wrap up the uh, Titus chapter uh, 1. And so uh, that's all I got for you. We have Wednesday night, we got dinner and discussion. And what are we having for, what's the menu? Uh, Italian. Italian food on Wednesday. We'll do Italian food on Wednesday. Be here at 6.30, dinner and discussion. We have dinner. Then we'll discuss something. We might discuss today's uh, message, or I might have something else for you. That's all I got, man. Go Bengals Deuce.